he who has a Y can bear any how. There are so many speed bumps along the way, from the little ones that happen every single day to that huge one that blindsides you on a random Tuesday afternoon that just feels like it knocks you for six. When I was young, my thing was just, I just loved sport, right? I just wanted to, I wanted to be a footballer, I wanted to play for Villa. So dad, granddad, great granddad and beyond all supported Villa. So I just loved football. I think it was when I was like sort of 15, 16, realised I was never going to be a professional. And it was at that point where it was my first sort of, sort of my first exposure to business. And that business was my granddad's business. It was more like manual labour, so I didn't have any knowledge, right? So I was either helping him with cement over the drum or helping him lay bricks or bolting in ceramic fibre into, um, into the furnace itself. So it was more just a eight, nine, 10 hours of do as you're told sort of thing, but it was really cool for me. And what was particularly interesting, and now looking back, as I know has helped me quite a lot, was the fact that he would tell me some of his sort of stories in starting his business. The lessons that I learned from just chatting to him over those long days of graft were absolutely brilliant. I, I think I asked him what was his biggest job that he ever did. And he told me about a furnace that he, I think he had to build for a company in Germany. And he explained to me that basically to fund that project, he had to remortgage the house. At that time he had uh, obviously my nan and my mom and her sister, young kids growing up. And he remortgaged his house. He basically managed to finish the project and then he was shipping it off to Germany. And if that company would have said no, then he could well have lost the house. So for me to hear that story of, uh, of his sort of entrepreneurial journey and how he risked everything from you know, his house to my nan's house to you know, the house that my mom grew up in, that at a young age, I think it really sort of helped me understand the risks that entrepreneurs take, but also, I guess, desensitised me to risk in some respects. Because then when a few years later on, I was giving up all of my, my life savings at the time to invest into Gymshark. My risk in comparison to his is like my new, I'm just risking the money I earned from pizza. He was risking potentially the house that my mum grew up in. So I think that made a real lasting impact on me. I joined the gym for the first first time when I was 16. When you first go to the gym, you've got no clue what you're doing. So I went to the local gym, got into weightlifting, didn't really do free weights because the free weights was full, full of, I guess, huge blokes. And I just didn't feel like I fit in there because as a kid, I was very skinny. And the reason that I joined the gym was to build muscle uh, and get a bit bigger and eventually build confidence. At that time, I was not very good at school. It just didn't resonate with me. I didn't enjoy it. And, I basically wasn't get, getting the grades that I should have got. And then when I went to the gym and I realised that if I turn up five days a week and I do the routine that I downloaded from online, then within a year I would be in a better position than when I left off. And that was the first real structure that I would sort of self-imposed on myself. And then about six, 12 months later, once I truly understood the gym and loved the gym, I then applied that to my school life and you know, my academic life and, and to learning. And all of a sudden my grades just started to rise rapidly and it, yeah, the gym completely changed my life. During sixth form, I picked up an IT class and that was the class that changed my life. And that's where I really got the bug for IT and tech. It was then after that when I joined university, I wanted to essentially de develop iPhone apps. Taught myself how to develop apps from books and YouTube videos and whatnot and develop four iPhone apps. And then I think it was six or seven websites prior to Gymshark. And at the time it was just a case of, I'm gonna make this happen, then this happen, then this happen, then this website. And I just really enjoyed making them. And because I was so into the gym, my, I guess I just wanted to be involved in the fitness industry, however, however that made sense. So when I was making apps, rather than just making any old app, I'd combine that with my passion for fitness and make fitness apps. It was just a combination of me creating, using the new tools that I had, creating for my passion that was fitness. So then talk us through start of Gymshark. Um, Bodybuilding clothing, number three. Right lads, the car's actually packaged and as you can see I can't actually move my chair back anymore. This one is just, the whole car basically is just absolutely rammed. 
So I wish I could say that I had this incredible strategic plan as to how it was all going to build out, but it was nothing like that. The reason that I actually made the Gymshark website was because I'd sort of done everything else. Not, not that I'd actually succeeded in it, because to be honest, I think everything else failed. I, I just wanted to make a fitness website that would transact. The only problem was I couldn't afford any stock to sell. I went to actually one of my friends that lived locally at the time. He worked for a company called USN, so a big South African supplement brand. And I said to him, like, right, what's the cheapest supplements I can buy off you so that I can sell them online, trying to buy stock for the website? And he said it was £8,000 a month, minimum order. And like, I mean, I'd never seen £8,000 in my life, let alone £8,000 a month. So that was just a complete no-go. So I sort of hit this brick wall. And then I thought, well, I could drop ship. And drop shipping was brilliant for me because it meant I could load up the website with thousands and thousands of different supplements. So the website was massive and it looked really professional and brilliant. Um, but I didn't have to buy any of the stock. So yes, I got to transact, which was brilliant, but it wasn't in the way that I wanted to. I wasn't holding stock at the time, but it was still an amazing experience and launched the website and absolutely nothing happened. Then a few months later, we had our first sale and it was just absolutely incredible. It was, it was 52 pounds of which about two pound of that was profit. It was the best two pound that I'd ever made in my life. Like it was just the most amazing feeling ever. And I was literally like running around my bedroom, just buzzing. And that was that. And Gymshark really didn't do a lot for the next few months. And then I remember being at the gym and just thinking like, no one makes the clothes that we want to wear. I just thought, why don't we, similar to websites and apps, why don't we just make them? So I bought a screen printer and a sewing machine and started to hand make the clothes that we wanted to wear to the gym. Even in that moment, it wasn't a case of, they had to make it to sell it. It just came from a place from, no one's making it, so let's just make it for ourselves. After a while, I decided to put things onto the website and, you know, the margins were much better on clothes and it just seemed to pick up traction so much more quickly than the supplements and people just started to fall in love with the product. I'll never forget, actually, at that point we were making our own clothes and it, there wasn't this period of own clothes and then produced elsewhere but there was a pair of shorts that I really wanted to produce. And I was messaging a guy and chatting to a guy in Pakistan called Tanvir. And he'd done all the sampling for free just as a favor. And we finished it and I said to him, this is absolutely brilliant, but the only problem is I can't afford to buy any of them. So can you do me a massive favor and produce, I think it was 250 pairs of these shorts and send them over to me in the UK. And I promise you Tanvir, I will pay you the money. And I thought there's no chance he's gonna say yes to this. There is not a chance in hell. But he was like, yeah, cool, let's do it. And he sent, sent me the, the product, we put it on the website, and it, again, it just flew out. 48 hours, I sent him the money for the full order. That was when we'd sort of both started producing clothes externally with manufacturers, but also internally as well, with the sewing machine and the screen printer. Took, there was about two years of hand-making product from my nan taught me to sew, my mom taught me to sew. I'd never forget, actually, there was a particular product that I was really struggling on with the sewing machine. And I just couldn't, I just couldn't solve this problem. I just couldn't do it. Um, and I had my, my shift at pizza would always be from five o'clock to 10, 10 o'clock. It was coming up to, I don't know, it must have been like half four or whatever. And I just couldn't do this thing. So I said to my mom, I was like, can you please do me a massive favor and just try and like solve this for me and video sort of an instruction for me so that when I come back from work, cause she'd have been, been in bed, I can then just go and do it. So there was this video that she recorded of basically how to sort the sewing machine out and how to do what I wanted to do. Um, and then I could come home and I guess, carry on sewing through the night and I had no idea that this would be anything for me that was just a bit of fun of an evening so yeah it's quite weird to look back now. Right out flat face down, pull the one side over, pull the other side over and then simply fold it over twice more like that and then you've got a perfectly folded t-shirt. Another happy Gymshark customer. because it's not massively labour intensive. So we programmed over here. You'll literally get a USB, stick it in here, and then that will just run. And just Whatever run. you're passionate about, just create and just go, because you know, one day down that meandering path, you'll end up finding something special that just happened to be the thing that everyone wanted in that moment, that just happened to be perfectly suited to the skill set that you have. All the different things that I've did 
all the seven failures previously, that's the reason that Gymshark is allowed to exist today. That's the reason that I and we are where we are today, is because of the app that failed, or the website that crashed, or the social network that had a, an error in the codes. All those things led to Gymshark. This is Ben Francis, handmade. This will go out today as well, so another happy customer for Gymshark. For the stock room, so a little bit of packaging here. More packaging there. So yeah, this is, um, this is the headquarters, if you will. I'd wake up in the morning, I'd go to university in the day, get on the train, get into Aston, normally finish uni, I don't know, say four, go into Pizza Hut and do my working day, five till 10, and then 10 p.m. onwards, I would essentially be working on Gymshark. After about a year, I was still working at Pizza Hut at the time. Um, the job as a delivery driver at Pizza Hut was quite useful because in between deliveries, I could jump on my phone and um, do sort of customer service responses. So it was great because I was obviously being paid to work there. I'd get a free pizza at the end of every shift and I could also work on, on Gymshark. So it was like the perfect job in many respects for me. And growing up, being a very, very introverted person, it was, it was very useful for me to be in front of people and having that sort of customer service like response. So I learned a lot doing the job as well. I think people underestimate the opportunity to take risk that you have when you're young. So going back to what I said right at the start, I managed to save, I think it was I don't know, 2,000 pounds or whatever it was, maybe it was probably less than that actually. And for me, that was my life savings and I risked everything. So that thing of, I, li I risked my life savings to do this, but it's just nothing in comparison to the risks that you know my grandparents and even my parents have taken. So. He who has a why can bear any how. Fitness was my why. Fitness completely changed my life. Going to the gym shifted everything. It shifted my physical health, my mental health. It completely shifted my academic life. So fitness for me was like my why. It was like, I want other people to have that experience. So for me to, li to risk what at the time was my life savings was, honestly, I, there was not a moment where I thought, should I or shouldn't I do this? It was just straight up, I know this is the right thing to do. The stars had to align for Gymshark to get to where it is and there's, there's literally about 15 different unique things that just happened to happen. So my mum could sew and my nan just randomly was doing a course in curtains at the time when I was looking at making this sort of stuff. So it was just the perfect time for me to learn to sew, to be honest. It was not something that I ever wanted to do or saw myself doing, but it was a means to get to where, where I wanted us to be and where I wanted the product to be. I absolutely loved it. It was brilliant and just, again, completely different, but that opportunity to create something is so important to me, whether it's an app or a website or a, a string of vest or a tank top or printing the logo onto a hoodie, whatever it is, I, I love that feeling of making things. Incredible speed of production. Look at the thickness of the ink. Yeah, it's looking good, nice and shiny. So much more is in the control of the individual than what people think. The only reason that I or Gymshark has gotten to where we are today is because we took control of the situation that I was in. I followed my passion and there was never a point where we've gone, the world has dealt us a bad hand, so we're just gonna mope. And I think that's so important that whatever happens and it's not everyone is dealt the same hand. Some people have a better hand than others and some people have more opportunity than others. And unfortunately, I think that's part of life and it's a shame and hopefully over our lifetimes, we can try and level that playing field as best we can. However, you dealt with a hand and ultimately that's the hand that you've got to play. And I think if you really take time to focus on self-development and improvement, I think you'd be very surprised as to the incredible gains that you can make. Was there a low moment that sort of took you, took you by surprise and made you think, oh, I don't want to do this anymore at all? Um didn't want to do this anymore. I don't know, to be honest. I would say the one that really hit me, like a bit of a, a steam train, was, so Gymshark was doing incredibly, incredibly well. So probably about four years into the journey, I think it was. It felt like everything we touched turned to gold, right? It was, like I said, three different occasions, we spent all of our life savings on something and it came off. and. Then we went and did the first expo, it came off. We went from doing one expo to about seven expos in a year and it just came off. Everything went incredibly well. We were traveling the world and it was incredible. But what we didn't do is we didn't invest properly enough in the foundations of the business. And then Black Friday came 
and basically the website just completely crashed and everything that could have gone wrong went wrong to the point where orders were going out without being paid for, um, people were paying for orders and stuff wasn't going out, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of people affected and at this point social media had been very with us and I'll never forget walking into the office and just seeing everyone's faces. When I say every single human being that worked at Gymshop was just trying to fix the problem that, that we created during Black Friday, I ended up handwriting apology letters to, it must have been over a thousand people, like so many different people and we just had months and months and months just trying to fix it. We just dedicated ourselves to solving the problem and doing our best, the best that we could by the customer and fortunately now I guess it's worked out for the best, I would say, because we've managed to build a company with ridiculously robust and strong foundations. And I think maybe if we hadn't had that baptism by fire, then maybe we wouldn't have built the, uh, the business that we built today. The one thing I would say is now, having done this for a long time, I think you do sort of learn sort of coping mechanisms and there's always something that's gonna go wrong, right? And there is always something that's gonna come back on you. And, and I definitely do feel it. And I think maybe this is one of the negatives of being so involved in and passionate about the community is, it, to your point, it's so good when it's going well, but when it's going bad, then the community and the thing that I really care about is obviously negatively affected. So I think I feel it quite a lot. It is incredibly tough, I won't lie. But again, I'm, I'm really lucky to have an amazing group of people around me, both professionally and personally, that can help support me and we all support one another because everyone at Gymshark, when things go wrong, everyone feels it. I think that's really important to mention. It is incredibly, incredibly tough. And I've had to sort of learn to be resilient. Every extra bit of responsibility that I've shouldered over the last few years has just improved me as a person, but also made me feel so much more fulfilled in life. And at Gymshark, again, going back to that, um, he who has a wife can bear any how, that's so important to me because there are so many speed bumps along the way from the little ones that happen every single day to that huge one that blindsides you on a random Tuesday afternoon that just feels like it knocks you for six. But when I'm thinking about that 10, 50, 100 year vision, they just all of a sudden become so small and easy to deal with. I love failure. I'm very, and I think we at Gymshark are, are actually getting really good at failing. Like we are really good. And, there's definitely not a feeling of negativity around failure because again, it's an opportunity to learn and I think we embrace failure. Yeah, I've always enjoyed and embraced failure and I think that's important too. Here we are just at FIBO setting up. This is gonna be insane. It's midnight, stand's almost ready and uh, tomorrow's D-Day. We reinvested everything that we possibly could into the business to grow it to where it was. And I knew the day that the business started that there wasn't gonna be a penny taken out of it for several years. I just loved it and I wanted to create the best brand I possibly could. And that was a genuine, genuine ambition of mine, which is why I think I was, there was no desire of me to sort of rinse the business for, for, for money. The other thing I would say is after a few years I had, managed through fortune and probably the odd great decision along the way to build an incredible team around me. So as the business got up to the stage where it could start, it genuinely had an opportunity to be a large scale business. So I think we were doing maybe 4 million in revenue, which at the time seemed massive, but compared to where we are now today, you know, it's, it was it's very much the startup phase. I met two guys, one called Paul, one called Steve, met them in the gym, funnily enough. Um, and then there was this this bit where they sort of sat me down and they said, do you want to be the biggest brand in Bromsgrove or do you want to try and make this into a global brand? And obviously I'd taken every risk possible to get it to that point. So I wasn't gonna, at that point gonna go, right, I'm gonna settle down here. And I said, I want it to be the biggest, I want it to be a truly global brand. And that was powerful as well, because again, when you've got the opportunity to create a global brand in a global community, I'm not gonna take an extra few hundred quid here and there just so that I can have a slightly nicer car. I, my ambition is to make this into a truly, truly global brand. So again, having my eyes locked on that vision, I think really helped as well. Factually so, numbers say that most businesses will fail in the first couple of years. And I never, 
I never had a fear of failing and I think that massively, massively worked to our advantage because we were so happy and so comfortable taking that gut-led decision so quickly and instinctively. I think, think that really helped because there might have been other companies that were in the same position as us that were umming and ahhing as to whether or not they should do certain things and we just did it. And I think that's so powerful because you can spend so much time worrying about failure or this, that and the other and before you know it, it's, you know, it's too late. Whereas I think we were just incredibly, incredibly brave and tenacious in our, uh, you know, in our pursuit of where we wanted to get to. And I think that's, I think genuinely that made a huge difference to, to how quickly we've managed to grow the business. The other thing we've been able to do is really grab ourselves around the scruff of the neck and just fix up. So going back to that Black Friday example, there was never a moment where we just moped and wallowed in self-pity. First and foremost, we're gonna fix it and then we're gonna make sure it never happens again. And I think that's really important as well. What's that saying, is it? Hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard, I think. I think Steve, our chief exec, talks about that. I think you have to work hard, right, to, in whatever that you do. And if you don't, then I just don't, don't think you'll, you'll get to where you want to be. Doesn't take up any room. Simple, quick, effective. <sighs> so uh, at least we're actually starting to get in order. So as a kid, so my dad worked away a lot. Like there were certain years he'd be away for like six months of the year, right? But like I said, I would play sport and he would take me to, to, to sport a lot. And he would never really talk to me about like fitness or speed or running. But the thing he would always, always drill into me for as long as I can remember was mindset. And he would always talk about you have to be strong mentally almost before you're strong physically. So mindset's a funny one. It's something that I feel, I feel like has been a part of my life for forever. Um, I think in many ways, mindset can solve everything right. Even the most terrible of problems with the right mindset can be dealt with well. But yeah, mindset's been something that I've been very consciously aware of for my entire life. What drives you now? just having as big an impact as possible. Financially, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm set, I'm fine, I'm doing, I'm, I'm beyond my wildest dreams as a kid growing up in the West Midlands. Like, this doesn't happen to people like me. So for me now, I'm really focused on one, being the most, the best that I can possibly be. You know, grow myself and be as, as brilliant as I can be. But equally, I want Gymshark to inspire as many people as possible. That's really, really important to me. And that's about improvement both physically and mentally as well. Because if you go back to my initial day one transformation, that was both mental and physical. And I think people underestimate the mental benefits of going to the gym. Life, business, what is the biggest lesson you've learned up so far? Um, I don't know if it's a lesson, but there's always one word that always sticks with me and has throughout. And that word is, is courage. Little things take courage, but also big leaps take courage. And I think that's something that needs to be spoken about a little bit more. Because if I even go back to Gymshark's journey as a company or on my own, every decision that we've made, we've made with courage and we've backed ourselves. And I think that's really, really important. Was it worth it? The pizza, the, the, <laughs> was, it, was, it, was it all worth it? Oh, 100%. It was so worth it. And by the way, like, this is the thing, I, I enjoyed working at Pizza. I met great people. I got to eat a free pizza every day. There is, that was so cool. There was never a point where I was like, oh, I hate this. Like, I enjoyed it. And I love what I do now. And I feel like I've got the best job in the world now. And that, that's not to say, right, like, there was obviously times I hated it. So like, like I said, freezing cold, cleaning off screens. In that moment, did I want to be there? No. But I knew that it was working towards something greater. Honestly, I've loved every second of it. The good times and the bad times, it's easy for me to say now. But I don't think the good times are as good if you don't have the crap times as well. So yeah, it's brilliant. Got the best job in the world. I just think of all the mental times I've, well, we've had and all the incredible opportunities that we've got in the future. Um, yeah, I think of all the events that we've done. I think of all the incredible people that I've met and just the amazing journey that we've been on.